London is built on a foundation of mysterious tales and a history as dark as the ancient subterranean world beneath its streets. By the time Queen Victoria ascended to the throne in 1837, the city sewers were already antiquated, crumbling to bits and desperately lacked the capacity to manage the waste of an ever-expanding industrial metropolis. And from 1848, all new houses were required to drain waste into these old sewers rather than cesspits. But the amount of waste choked the tunnels and in times of heavy rain a filthy mix of sewage and rainwater would flood the streets and the basements of houses and pubs. Whether it overflowed or not, all this foul water eventually discharged into the River Thames. The smell was so bad that in the hot summer of 1858 it was called the Great Stink and it took this overpowering stench to plague Westminster before politicians were finally forced into paying to reconstruct the decrepit sewerage system. Before these monumental works were completed, however, the shocking state of London sewers tormented both rich and poor alike. One survey found that in the costly squares and streets of Hyde Park Gardens, the sewers were foul and a stench from a disgusting effluvium arises. Poorly ventilated sewers could get so backed up with putrid matter that explosions from excess gas were not uncommon. In such a murky underworld, is it any wonder that an army of vermin and perhaps other creatures could run rampant, feeding on the never-ending muck and filth that found its way into the dark and decrepit tunnels beneath the feet of Londoners? For if human scavengers could make a living from the detritus on the city streets, then scavengers of a different nature could live on the same bones and scraps that found their way underground. London was alive with thousands of animals, both for use in transport and at livestock markets for feeding and clothing its population. But, unlike horses, sheep and cows, fed on hay, grains and corn, pigs eat anything. Wild hogs will eat vegetables, insects and meat, including mammals. The refuse to be found in the sewers could be described, rather grimly, as a hog's banquet. In many a poor court, alley and lane, where there was no drainage, all the slops from houses, along with the blood and offal from butchers' premises, were thrown into gully holes and thereby conveyed to sewers. A disgusting and yet veritable feast for vermin in the dark recesses under London streets. The sewer hunters, toshers, of Victorian London, made money by scavenging these tunnels for metal, coins and recyclables, both a dirty and dangerous job by all accounts, for, alongside the risk of injury from collapsing sewer tunnels, it is said that there was also swarms of giant rats breeding in nests of crumbling brick walls, fed ceaselessly on this rich diet of waste and said to be fearsome. Sewer hunters told of huge man-eating rats, with nothing but the bones left of one man discovered in the 1830s, the rats having eaten every bit of him. So imagine a city full of tens of thousands of animals. Is it hard to imagine that some might escape? No. Is it hard to imagine that some might find their way through open sewers into a subterranean labyrinth where food, however disgusting it might be to our eyes, is plentiful and survive? Possibly. A pig. Being an omnivore and turned wild isn't fussy about its diet, and Victorian London certainly wasn't fussy about the muck it washed down the drains that could feed a creature that found its way into the sewer system. With monstrous rats known to lurk in London's sewer tunnels and attack men, is it hard to believe that other creatures, grown freakish on the city's waste, might also have plagued Victorian Londoners? This is a question that the Victorian journalist Henry Mayhew, writing in the early 1850s, considers. Being concerned with the lives and labours of London's poor, he interviewed many working-class people and heard many incredible tales. The story that you will hear today is Mayhew's account of ferocious creatures running wild in the tunnels under the streets of London. Whether you believe what you hear or dismiss it as an urban legend, you may well agree that London's dark and fetid sewers contained all the disgusting ingredients that would spawn monstrous stories, if not monsters themselves. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. 
If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. Where the deposit is found the greatest, the sewer is in the worst state. Some of the sewers, indeed, are represented as the dustbins and dunghills of the immediate neighborhood. The deposit has been found to comprise all the ingredients from the breweries, the gasworks, and the several chemical and mineral manufactories, dead dogs, cats, kittens, and rats, awful from slaughterhouses, sometimes even including the entrails of the animals, street pavement dirt of every variety, vegetable refuse, stable dung, the refuse of pigsties, night soil, human waste, ashes, tin kettles and pans, pan shards, broken stoneware, jars, pitchers, flower pots, etc., bricks, pieces of wood, rotten mortar and rubbish of different kinds and even rags. Our criminal annals of the previous century show that often enough the bodies of murdered men were thrown into the fleet and other ditches, then the open sewers of the metropolis, and if found washed into the Thames, they were so stained and disfigured by the foulness of the contents of these ditches that recognition was often impossible so that there could be but one verdict returned, found, drowned. Clothes stripped from a murdered person have been, it was authenticated on several occasions in Old Bailey evidence, thrown into the open sewer ditches, when torn and defaced, so that they might not supply evidence of identity. So close is the connection between physical filthiness in public matters and moral wickedness. In my inquiries among the curious body of shore workers, the sewer hunters, I found them make light of any danger, their principal fear being from the attacks of rats, in case they became isolated from the gang with whom they searched in common, while they represented the odour as a mere nothing in the way of unpleasantness. But these men pursued only known, and, by them, beaten tracks at low water, avoiding any deviation and so becoming but partially acquainted with the character and direction of the sewers. The rat is the only animal found in the sewers. I met with no flusher man or other sewer worker who had ever seen a lizard, toad, or frog there, although the existence of these creatures in such circumstances has been presumed. A few live cats find their way into the subterranean channels when a house drain is being built, or is opened for repairs, or for any purpose, and have been seen by the flushermen, etc., wandering about, looking lost, mewing as if in misery, and avoiding any contact with the sewage. The rats also, for they are not of the water rat breed, are exceedingly averse to wetting their feet, and take to the sewage, as it was worded to me, only in prospect of danger, that is, they then swim across or along the current to escape with their lives. It is said that when a luckless cat has ventured into the sewers, she is sometimes literally worried by the rats. I could not hear of such an attack having been witnessed by anyone. But one intelligent and trustworthy man said that a few years back, he believed about eight years, he had in one week found the skeletons of two cats in a particular part of an old sewer, Twenty-one feet wide, and in the drains opening into it were perfect colonies of rats, raging with hunger. He had no doubt, because a system of trapping, newly resorted to, had prevented their usual ingress into the houses up the drains. A portion of their fur adhered to the two cats, but the flesh had been eaten from their bones. About that time a troop of rats flew at the feet of another of my informants, and would no doubt have maimed him seriously. But my boots, said he, stop the devils. The sewers generally swarms with rats, said another man. I runs away from them. I don't like them. They in general get away from us. But in case we comes to a stunt end where there's a wall and no place for them to get away, and we goes to touch them, they fly at us. There's some of them as big as good-sized kittens. 
One of our men caught hold of one the other day by the tail, and he found it trying to release itself, and the tail slipping through his fingers. So he put up his left hand to stop it, and the rat caught hold of his finger, and the man's got an arm now as big as his thigh. I heard from several that there have been occasionally battles among the rats, one with another. The rats, from the best information at my command, do not derive much of their sustenance from the matter in the sewers, or only in particular localities. These localities are the sewers neighbouring a connecting series of slaughterhouses, as in Newgate Market, Whitechapel, Clare Market, parts adjoining Smithfield Market, etc. There, animal offal, being, and having been to a much greater extent five or six years ago, swept into the drains and sewers, the rats find their food. In the sewers, generally, there is little food for them, and none at all in the best constructed sewers, where there is a regular and sometimes rapid flow, and little or no deposit. The sewers are these animals' breeding grounds. In them, the broods are usually safe from the molestation of men, dogs, or cats. These breeding grounds are sometimes in the holes, excavated by the industry of the rats into caves, which have been formed in the old sewers by a crumbled brick having fallen out. Their nests, however, are in some parts even more frequent in places where old rotting large house drains or smaller sewers empty themselves into a first-class sewer. Here, then, the rats breed, and, in spite of precautions, find their way up the drains or pipes, even through the openings into water closets, into the houses for their food, and almost always at night. There is a strange tale in existence among the shore workers, of a race of wild hogs inhabiting the sewers in the neighbourhood of Hampstead, then more rural, but now a wealthy area of inner London. The story runs that a sow in young, by some accident, got down the sewer through an opening, and, wandering away from the spot, littered and reared her offspring in the drain, feeding on the offal and garbage washed into it continually. Here, it is alleged, the breed multiplied exceedingly, and have become almost as ferocious as they are numerous. This story, apocryphal as it seems, has nevertheless its believers, and it is ingeniously argued that the reason why none of the subterranean animals have been able to make their way to the light of day is that they could only do so by reaching the mouth of the sewer at the riverside, while, in order to arrive at that point, they must necessarily encounter the fleet ditch, which runs towards the river with great rapidity. And as it is the obstinate nature of a pig to swim against the stream, the wild hogs of the sewers invariably work their way back to their original quarters, and are thus never to be seen. What seems strange in the matter is that the inhabitants of Hampstead never have been known to see any of these animals pass beneath the gratings, nor to have been disturbed by their gruntings. You can, of course, believe as much of the story as you please, and it is right to inform you that the sewer hunters themselves have never yet encountered any of the fabulous monsters of the Hampstead sewers. So, what do you think? Do you believe Mayhew's story? Would you dismiss it merely as folklore of the sewer hunters, or is it possible that feral pigs rampaged through the city's sewers? Even if you consider his account to be simply fantasy, or, at best, having a kernel of truth, but highly embellished, you might at least believe that the dark subterranean world beneath Victorian London streets created a habitat that actually did spawn ferocious creatures monstrous sewer rats <laughs>